so uh, today I will talk about graph visualization. And uh, okay, so when I say graphs, actually I meant not these graphs. I'll call these charts. And uh, this is what I meant by graphs. And some people would more prefer to call them networks. And um, but graph is like a more formal way to call them. And um, so this is what we're going through today fairly quickly. And um, so actually, say graph visualization is kind of part of the visual analytics or information visualization more traditionally. And it looks at a particular type of data, which has a topological structure. But it actually has many related fields. And uh, if I can put an axis here, at the top end is more applied, which is closer to human. At the bottom one is more theoretical. At least this is how I understand those. So it's actually related to visual perception and psychology, like cognitive psychology, and of course human computer interaction, visual analytics, <clears throat> and also graph join. How many of you heard of graph join? And so it's like a particular subfield in the algorithm and community which is looking at and graph related algorithms. So related closely related to say graph theory, etc. And then of course algorithm part and purely mathematics. And so it's kind of like continuous spectrum. So you have people working in more say well defined say human computer action, but there's people also working on kind of boundary between more than one field actually. And there's many actual application domains that use and quite a bit of graph visualization as well. So I listed some and say sociology. So you have seen lots of, probably seen some social network analysis, different centralities. So that's pretty much graph related, but it's more originated from sociology background. And more recently, there's uh, lots of work in the biology actually starting using more and more networks as well. And something they usually refer to as system biology which is they try to understand, say, a human body as a system connected by many different components at different levels. Say, so the high levels is your organs down to very low level as your DNA is how they work together as a network. And all, of course, physics as well. Um, there's lots of work in physics, which is kind of like a, a plaid, applied in mathematics, which look at the fundamental theory about graph. So all these actually are very important. Um, okay, so of course, given an hour, it's not possible to include everything mentioned here. And all I'm really trying to do is just try and cover the basics, and which is kind of in between the human computer interaction and the visual analytics. And uh, I assume we don't have any knowledge about graph algorithm at all, so don't worry if you don't know anything, but I'm all apologize now if you know many of these already. And, uh, okay, what will be touched? And we'll talk about some visual representations, and particularly about trees, which is a simplified version of general graph. And uh, this represents one type of kind of, one type of work which you commonly see in the visualization research field, which is designing new visual representations for abstract data to make them, say, make the user easier for the user to understand or show some patterns. And uh, we'll talk very briefly about layout algorithms. This is for more general graphs. So the trees were the simplified case of these general graphs. But I would only be able to, say, cover the basic ideas behind the algorithm rather than any details. And uh, I'll talk about a little bit about evaluation as well. So this is evaluation about different visual representation and layout algorithms. And because, and the whole purpose of visualization is not just to make a pretty picture, saying the picture is not evaluated by how beautiful they are, in some cases, but more importantly is how useful they are for people to solve the problem at hand. So, and you will see some evaluation results, some are quite surprising. So, in many cases, and you will find maybe the most aesthetically pleasing visualization is not necessarily the most useful one. And finally, I'll talk about some applications of libraries. And so these are more kind of practical information. And if you want to start doing some work, visualize some or your own networks and where can you start. 
And so this includes softwares, which basically have provided every function through its graphical user interface. You don't have to do any coding at all. And up to more, say, sophisticated libraries where you can have full controls of what you're trying to do in your visualization or computation. And uh, yeah, so I just want to emphasize again, so because it's a quiet and broad and diverse field, so there's a lot of things will not be covered in this talk. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, we'll start with the visual representations for a tree. And uh, before we're going to show you the pi pretty pictures, I want to show, just go through the basic concepts or the terms I'm going to use to describe this visualization. And so there's trees and a slightly more general case called hierarchies. And sometimes they were used interchangeably, but they have slightly subtle difference. And Okay, so here I give a definition of a tree. So basically, it's a connected graph without cycles, and a little bit abstract. And uh, but you probably haven't seen say, and diagrams like this many times. So that's a typical representation of a tree. And I also want to introduce the, uh, and concept called parent, child, and siblings. And so in a tree, and you always have a root. And unlike the real tree, it's actually drawn on the very top of the diagram, rather than at the bottom. And the root is the parent in this example of node 2, 3, and 4. And in turn, node number 2 is the parent of 5, 10, and 11. Yeah? So that's parent. And uh, just opposite of that, then say node number 2 is the child of root. Similarly, node number 10, again, is child of number two. And nodes sharing parents will be called siblings. So in this example, node two, three, and four and siblings, they have the same parent, which is node. Okay, we already mentioned the root, and but if you define formally, root is a node which doesn't have a parent. So in this case, will be the node is called root. And the leaf are the nodes which doesn't have further children. And um, anyone give me an example of what a leaf might be in this case? Is, num is node number five a leaf? Yes. Uh, number four? Number four is very right. Yes, because it doesn't have any more children, so these are some leaves. Okay, um, so we have look up the trees. Next one is hierarchy. What is a hierarchy? Okay, a connected uh, direct gra graphs without cycles. Okay, so there's <laughs> one new thing here. So we're talking about direct graphs. So these are graphs which edge has directions. Say in this example, the first example we saw, we don't really have directions on the edges, but you, you can. And this is actually quite common in <coughs> the real world. Say if I have a social network, Say you have an email communication network, you have directions, okay, who sent a message to who, or who emailed who. So of course, it's directions. And this is an example of a hierarchy, and uh, looks quite similar to a tree. And you can see there's something slightly different here. Say, for example, if you look at, uh, um, which one will be the good one here? Okay, for example, if you look at node number seven here, so it actually has two parents. So node, both node three and four as parents, which is only happen, you can only have in hierarchies. And if you look, go back, look at the tree, you, you can't have a children ha or node has more than one parent. And because this is a directed graph, and even you can have multiple parents, it doesn't have a cycle. And uh, to make things a little bit more complicated, if you imagine we don't really have the directions on the edge, you can say, for example, uh, node 4, 7, oh, that's not a good one, okay, uh, node root 3, 7, and 4 forms a cycle if this edge doesn't have directions. Okay, hopefully it's not confusing anymore. And uh, say once a graph has a cycle, either directed or indirect, it becomes a more general graph. It's neither a tree or hierarchy anymore. 
Okay, so why we spend so much time and energy on Trillion hierarchies? And because they somehow very important in visualization, and mostly because they are very common in real world. But more importantly, they are simpler, and in terms of kind of a complexity of the data structure itself, because it has less edges, it has nice, and this kind of constraints, say no cycles, actually made lots of algorithms possible to apply to fairly large size trees and hierarchies, which will be impractical on general graphs. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do next is actually to go through a few visual representations of tree. It's okay. Um, so, as I said, say one type of work in the information validation is to design new visual representations for the abstract data. So we already actually see, say, one type of visualization, visual representation of trees already. And this is another one, fairly early one, called Tree Viewer. And uh, this is, so it visualizes a tree just as a real tree. And so we have the tree data structure on the top. And uh, node A16 is a root and has all the children's. And the bottom one is the tree viewer representation of this data. And so actually, the root is the tree stems, the trunk at the bottom, and uh, node and leaves are the branches. And so, sorry, non leaf nodes are the branches. So each of the branches represents a node, and they're connected as edges in the tree structure. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, okay, finally the leaf nodes are bulbs, which you will see very at the end of the branches. So this is very literally just like a tree. So you have the root at the very bottom, each of the trunk, each of the branches represent the nodes, and all these little bulbs, nice looking bulbs at the end are the leaves, very literally. Okay, uh, the next one is the most famous tree visualization. Anyone has any guess? Oh, okay, so you got, if you've got, already got slides, then you already know the answer. <laughs> okay, and um, it's called indented layout, which is like an acad academic name for the layout. But really, it's just, um, say, it's probably most people see it as a, a Windows Explorer. I think you all know how the Windows Explorer you use as after many, many years of using them, except for those that stick with Mac or Linux. Um, I didn't really want to describe exactly how it works. <clears throat> but what I want to mention is, um, so there's some limitations of this method, and it's relatively good when you're showing part of the trees. And it's not really practical to expand all possible branches using this presentation. And if you ever try, and in Windows, if you try to expand all possible directories and subdirectories, you've got a very long, long list, which is not ideal for visualization or understand the structure of this hierarchy. And uh, it's not a particular, particularly good aspect ratio. Basically, that's the ratio between the width and the and height, say, of this visualization, it's all usually be extremely long. I mean, it's maybe work quite well in the setup like a Windows Explorer, and but as a general visualization, you usually want to the aspect ratio of the visualization close to your aspect ratio of the display, so you can use mu as much display space as possible. Okay, and um, this one we have already seen, but uh, usually. More formally, we call it layer the layout. So it just putting different nodes in a tree onto, and say this one is a horizontal layers. Or you can put into concentric circles, give you the radial join. So in this join, say the root at the very middle, and uh, all its children is on the first concentric circle, and goes on, goes on. Essentially, this is still a different and a layer the layout where. Each layer is a is a circle. Okay, and this one is 
probably you have seen this one before as well, say dendrograms, or may have some other names as well. And again, it's a layered join, so the node is actually put into parallel layers. And uh, okay, it has orthogonal edges, which give a slightly different visual looking or looking. And the diff main difference is the layering is done according to the leaves. And so instead of starting from the root, it starts from the very bottom and make sure all the leaves are on the same level and goes back up. So that ensures and that all the parents of the leaves are on the next level, etc. etc. And quite popular in bioinformatics and used to present hierarchical plasting, which is not just say limited to bioinformatics domain, but also something called the phy phylogenetic trees. And which is an example would be like the tree of life. <coughs> you can see all the evolution relationships between different species and that's quite common and in biology and you have to say represent how the different relationship between different sequences how that involved over time. Okay, uh, these are also quite a common one and probably most uh, popular space feeling methods which is called tree map and so it using a slightly different way to represent the hierarchical structure in a tree. And so the parent-child relationship is shown as a containment. And so we have example here. And on the left is a tree. And on the right is the tree map representation of the exact same data, but different representation. And uh, so as you can see, the root node which is number one, is the biggest rectangle on the outside. And root number one, node number one has two children, which is our node two and three. So you can see within the big rectangle, you have, uh, it's kind of partitioned into two areas. One is called node number two, it's marked as two, which represents node number two. And the other one is marked three, which represents node as three. And this node number two is further divided according to its subtrees and the node number two. So it's partitioned into four and five and goes on. Okay. <clears throat> so, and the only thing I want to mention here is, and the size of each child, uh, child node is according to how many, the, the size of the subtree under it. So basically, and if, say for example, in this example, node number two has lots of children, or children's children, so it's got a relatively big area compared to node number three. And, okay, the most advantage, or the biggest advantage of space feeling method or tree map <coughs> is space efficient, and so you can always adjust the aspect ratio to have the tree map occupy your whole display area with no space wasted at all. And it's quite effective of showing the leaf nodes, or at least I think, and less so for the non-leaf nodes. But actually this one is not too bad. So this is actually a more practical example of showing, I think, stock price. And it's divided according to which industry sector that stock a company is in. And the red and green is showing whether it's increasing or and decreasing prices. And it's fairly easy to see um, how the individual stocks are doing, but less so in terms of hierarchical structure between the different stocks. Um, okay, and uh, so there's variations of tree maps to try to improve that. And this one is called a cushion tree map. And it adds this artificial 3D feeling to the contentious relationship, try to emphasize and the median say the non leaf nodes and how the relationships and to the root and to each other. Does that make sense? So essentially this is still the a tree map. It's just okay, you can see more clearly, say maybe all the nodes and a branch will be kind of grouped clearly together. And another variation, quite nice, is called the Voronoi tree maps. Again, so it's the same idea as a tree map, 
and use the same structure to show the tree hierarchy, but it, uh, it use a Voronoi diagram. Anyone knows what Voronoi diagram is? Yeah, only a few, but and I would part from quite be. Um, at least that's quite a popular thing you use in compositional geometry, and it's partition space to find the thing. Yeah, and uh, the closest side. But anyway, so you can actually have tree maps which has boundaries. It doesn't look like rectangles can be circle or triangle. Actually, in other shape as well. Okay. Um, this is also an, a variation of tree map, but doesn't so look so much like a tree map. They call themselves a 3D variation of the tree map. And so instead of using the contentship to show the parent-child relationship, it use this overlapping relationship. And to show, on, you can in the figure B here, so instead of Say the darker gray note is a, represents a node, and the lighter gray, the vertical bar, is it's represents its children. And the child relationship is shown by, say, putting the child nodes in front of or kind of cover the parent nodes in a, say, orthogonal direction. Let's talk about that. And uh, so they call each of these bars either vertical or horizontal one beams and you can they try to make it strengthen to make this overlapping effects more obvious <clears throat> so if, if you compare the one on the very left to the one on the right it's easier to see which one is on top of which beams in the right ones and uh, you probably can't see it very clearly but this is more like a real example <coughs> showing a hierarchy using the beam Okay, and we've got a couple more to go, and this one is called the icicle trees. <coughs> this is again, say, something not quite layered or and just tree map like. Um, so the edges between the nodes is implied by the adjacency and special relationships. Okay, again, if we look at the examples on the left, this is a tree we have seen before. And how this is represented is, okay, so the root and is the bar on the top, marked as number one. It has two children, and node two and three, which is directly below it. So that means, okay, these are the two children. And <coughs> the children of node number two is directly below it, within the same width, and it goes on. I think, I think it should be fairly easy to understand the tree structure this way. And uh, this is uh, a big example I got from using the InfoViz toolkit. And uh, also the color is used here to show the different shapes between different branches. Okay, I think this is probably the last one. And code information slides and some best. And very similar to the one we just saw before, the icicle ones. But instead of showing all the, let's say, the levels or the layers, horizontal layer, this is again using concentric circles. And again, say the root, which is not number one, is in the middle, shown on the right as number one. It has two children, which are no number two and three, which sits, uh, or which say, um, in the concentric circle, right outside number one. And keep going on, say node number two has two more children, four and five, and these will be sit right below outside. Yeah, so we can say this is a radio version of the icicle trees. Again, the node size is proportional to the angle swept by a node. So basically the node size and um, kind of decided by how many children it has. Okay, so that's the information slides, and you can have a slightly more advanced version called Sunburst. And uh, I should show these. So it's information slides plus focus plus context. 
which is a common technique when you use to visualize and enlarge data sets. And focus plus context is where you can select part of the data of the visualization, which is your focus, and you can show more details using some specific display area while showing the whole data set as a context of that. Uh, so what we see here is you can combine the information slides and select the part of it and show the details of it. So if you look at example on the left, and in the middle you have the normal information slides and the small circle there, if you can see, and, and the out part, this part here, actually shows an expanded or enlarged version of what selected here. So that's your focus, which shows details. And you can do the same by using, and uh, say, the inside space of the sound base as well. You can imagine you include, you make the root node very big, you can enough space, and you can select some part of your um, hierarchy, and the details were shown in the middle. Okay, that's a lot of time. Um, okay, so I showed you quite a few different ways to represent tree visually. And uh, so now I'm going to go through two different studies. And the first study is looking at the utility of the visualization. So these are the cases when you get people to use different visual representation of your hierarchy to perform certain tasks and evaluate how, the people, how well people perform using different visualizations. And this is one reported back at 2004. They used six different visualizations, which are listed at the bottom. And uh, we have seen them all of them already, uh, except the, the fourth one. And so there's still more tree visualization we haven't covered yet. But the fourth one is kind of close to a radio layered layout. And the data set they used is eBay taxonomy. And so basically, this is kind of a category you have on the eBay. So you start with the different directories and products and subdirectories. And totally four le five levels and 5,800 nodes. It's quite a shallow and wide directory. They have actually lots of tasks. And these are um, questions regarding the tree structure and node attributes. And uh, fairly standard, they measure the accuracy, completion time, and user satisfaction. OK, and uh, results. Um, Windows, Ex score, uh, Windows Explorer scores best. So basically, <laughs> this one scores the best, and which I personally is the least well designed. And uh, only tree maps achieves the similar levels as the Explorer. And so the tree map is at the bottom at the very left. That one achieves a similar level of performance as the Explorer, and others perform worse. OK, so that's the thing. Uh, so the possible cause of this is, first thing is and system familiarity. So because most of the people would have been using the Explorer for years, whereas for the other visualization, they're probably their first time using them. And the only chance they got to practice is during the experiment. So obviously, there's a, dis uh, there's a disadvantage for the and other visualizations which are new to the people participating in experiment. And the other thing is, really, um, could be like a related design to, to the study because Really, they are comparing, say, the systems implemented in these visualizations rather than the visualization itself. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the user of Windows Explorer come up with all the functions which are already in the Explorer, and they will use an implementation, say, for this one, Tree Viewer. <laughs> but the function provided the program implements the Tree Viewer is not necessarily the same set of functions you have in the Windows Explorer. And so you can imagine, say, if one implementation has lots more or better implementations compared to the other, that could affect the results as well. So it's not necessarily reflect and just the visualization of the data. And so 
I guess that's the same thing. You be very careful reading any papers and doing evaluation. You really have to interpret. Okay, looking at all the constraints in the experiment, are there really fair comparisons of anything which not quite right? Okay, um, this is another evaluation. Again, about tree representations. Um, but this time it's about statics. So basically, it's ask people to rate how much they like the visualization depends on how beautiful they think they are. And there's uh, 11 um, different tree visualizations. Um, you probably can't really read the text, but we have and went through most of them already. And say the ver so it's the start with the tree map and uh, icicle trees, slightly different. Space tree, more or less a layer, the layout of the trees. Windows Explorer, bean tree. Okay, star tree is something we haven't encountered yet, but something close to a radiant version of layered tree. Dendrogram, we've seen that. Rain gold, tougher, polar views. We didn't touch that at all. Star trees and Botanic Viewer, which is a tree viewer, and finally Sunburst. And, okay, so, so this one ranked the worst, and the bean trees, in terms of people, how much people like it. So, basically it means it's least likely people will pick this one if they have the option to choose. These three are the less popular ones, quite close to the rank, and uh, finally, and this is the most popular one by a certain margin, which is some best. And so it's actually it will be quite interesting to see a study expanded the one with the, the first one we just saw to include more different visual representations to evaluate actually in terms of utility which one actually works better. And so that's what the paper I talked about. So this is a Kai paper in 2007. Okay, uh, so I've so you talked about different tree visualization. Now I'm going to talk about a little bit about layout. And uh, this is again in the case of more general graphs. <coughs> and uh, the first question is are these the same graphs? So actually, I colored nodes and give them numbers. So they can easily match them, but uh, are they the same graphs? Yeah, the answer is yes. And if you spend maybe a few more minutes, you can actually check that yourself. And so basically what layout does is layout give different and positions, actually the drawing of the edges as well, to put a graph into say a nice representation which will make it easier for user to understand. And say on the top left corner is something called a random layout. So basically the nodes, the position of the nodes are randomly decided and not doesn't particularly nice. And uh, top right is the force directed layout. So it's one way to lay out the graph which looks nicer. I would say nicer compared to the first one. And uh, the bottom left is called the circular which is quite popular among say sociologists give you a kind of a structure all the nodes on a circle and then the bottom right one is called hierarchical one very similar to the layer the tree layout we've seen before and one thing that I can want to point out is a layout can give you a quite a dramatically different impression of the data just depends on which layout you choose um, and could, as a result, inf impact how you understand or try to interpret the network as well. Say, for example, if you give people a network which represents in the circular layout, they always will imagine this kind of circle in the data that's kind, and take that as granted as, say, the circle is a fundamental structure in this data. But in many cases, that's not necessarily the case. Um... Okay, given time. Say, okay, so layout is usually generated automatically by an algorithm. 
and the algorithm doesn't have a say a subjective opinion of how beautiful the layout is, so they have to give them certain very easy to measure or computer metrics to tell whether they're doing a good job or not. And these are called the graph drawing and aesthetics. So the algorithm will try to optimize these aesthetics and as a result hopefully to provide a good join. So the example of aesthetics include edge crossings. So these are two very simple graphs and one has one crossings, the other don't. So in general people think edge crossing is bad for a visualization. So algorithm can try to reduce the number of edge crossings. And you can try to improve aspect ratio. So you more try to say make the results more closer to a square shaped one on the right rather than say very thin long one on the left. And you can try to reduce the edge length in the drawing, which I don't really have an example. Because edge lens is really if you have to fix a certain side, and then you can talk about edge lens rather than say just scale the graph itself. That doesn't make too much sense. And something also called angular resolution. So you can try to improve the minimum angle between two edges. For example, I'm showing a bad example here where you have lots of small angles between two edges. And for example, so you have small angles here between these two, you can see, and there's quite a few small angles here as well. So you can try, usually people think, if you improve those and make those small angles bigger, it's easy for people to see. And finally, um, <coughs> so you can have algorithm try to, in, say, optimize for symmetry. And so the one on the Bottom right is actually a visualization of the network shows the symmetry in the data for it very nicely. Uh, okay, and uh, so there's people doing user studies to <coughs> evaluate which aesthetics actually is most important. And um, so, as we said in the last slides, most of these aesthetics criteria are based on people's intuitions and how effective they are and for different tasks is evaluated in this experiment. So I probably have to go through fairly quickly because of the time. And so the study evaluates four different aesthetics criteria. Crossings we have seen before. Bands <coughs> is number of the bands in the edges. This is when you can edges is not necessarily a straight line. And so you can see B, and the first one on the left is bends, so you can have um, edge as straight lines, or you can have edge as, and say, polylines, or line, a few line segments, which has bends. And the second set um, is comparing crossings. The third set is M, M stands for minimum angle. So we talked about angular resolution before. So basically the bottom one, which has M minus, so it shows the one with poor angular resolution. And the fourth pair, which is the one here, is show comparing all orthogonality. So the top join is actually rooted the edges or joint edges in orthogonal ways. So the edges either are vertical or horizontal lines, whether the bottom one doesn't have. And finally, the joints is comparing symmetry. So the top one tried to show the symmetry in the uh, graph and the bottom one is not. And so the result showing, and actually, uh, so they get people to do various tasks on the graphs, and the result showing actually edge crossing is most important, and less effective is edge bend, and which is the first pair, <coughs> and symmetry, which is the last pair, and didn't see any significant difference are the angular resolution, which is the middle one, so basically people perform the or more or less the same when using the two different joints, which is a bit surprising, and also the orthogonality with the force pair. And okay, so now I'm going to say introduce a very popular method to draw undirected graphs. So again, undirected graphs means the graph it doesn't have directions for its edges, and this is called the force director method, but uh, 
in this particular example, I talk about this also called Spring Embedder. Um, in trying to, how do I say, um, give the force to nodes and edges. And so in this case, each node is a uh, electronic charged particles and with the same polar, and they repel each other. So this is to ensure nodes are not too close to each other. So basically what happens is you give pairwise repulsion force between every pair of nodes. So you can see each of the old area there means that the force try to push the nodes away from each other. So it doesn't really matter whether the, whether the edge or not. And the edges are modeled as a springs that connects these particles or nodes. And uh, so if you, I mean, if you ever say tried a spring before, the mental spring will become attraction force when the distance between the strings is longer than the natural length or repulsion force otherwise. So this is what happens. So for each edge, it's replaced with a spring and for example, this one is kind of squeezed. So it's actually, again, try to pushing the two nodes away. And for this one, it's kind of pulled apart. So what it does is try to pull these two nodes closer together, give it a traction force. So what the algorithm does is, okay, it set up all these different forces between nodes and let it go. And the idea is when the system balance, should produce a fairly nice result. So this is what it will stop when the system balance. Okay, um, so we talked about many different uh, aesthetics criteria before, and anyone want to guess? So what this and um, particular algorithm try to optimize? Are they trying to optimize edge crossings? Angular resolution, edge lens, symmetry, any guesses? This is not in your slide. I'm trying to maximize the, the, the smallest angle between any two. Yeah. yeah, that's one guess. Any other guesses? Okay, uh, okay. so it's actually trying to optimize symmetry, and as a result, it's actually produced a join with good angular resolution, less number of edge crossings as well. So that's something quite interesting. And in practice, because it's, and usually it's actually too difficult to optimize any of those aesthetics criteria. It's very difficult, I mean, computationally, to find the joints with least number of um, edge crossings, instead of using heuristics like this, which produce a nice join with relative and uh, less number of edge crossings. Okay, uh, just to show how it works, and you probably have seen this in different forms many times already. So the force acting to each other, pushing the nodes around, and this is <coughs> not really quite a final set, but <coughs> this is usually how it works. Okay, um, so next I'm going to be talking about, um, say, a layout for directed graphs. And probably most popular one is layer the layout. So this is what would look like at the very end. And this is actually, this is much more complex than the four therapy method I mentioned before. So for the first four therapy method, everyone can spend a day or two just write his, his or her own implementation already. But this one, if you spend just one day or two, you probably wouldn't even understand the algorithm itself yet. But anyway, I'll give it a try. And this is sometimes also called Sukiyama method. And because it's too complex, the method itself has to be break into steps. And people can only try to optimize within each step. There's no any effort actually try to optimize globally, which I'll show later on. And so first thing is called cycle removal, which is fairly straightforward, basically. And the algorithm done like cycles in the graph. And there's a way to remove cycles by and reverse directions of the edges. So you can try to find the minimum number of edges you have to reverse its direction to remove all the cycles in the graph. 
And in this one, we don't have any case, but you can imagine if you have a cycle which is directed edges, and you reverse the direction of one of its edges, then the cycle is no longer exist. And the second step is called layer assignment. And so this is basically putting nodes into different layers. So in, in our case, in this case, it will kind of decide the y coordinates of different nodes. And this is also where you adding those green ones, which are called dummy nodes. So basically, oh, sorry, uh, no, not quite that yet, not the green one. And uh, the next step is called uh, and crossing reduction. So once you have the nodes within each layer, you want to change the orders within a layer, try to minimize the crossings between two layers. And for example, if you uh, look at maybe the top two layers, you can see the edge crossings between the two layers. And in some cases, you can reduce the number of edge crossings between two layers by moving the relative orders between the nodes. And uh, the final is the horizontal coordinate assignment. So in this case, it's to actually decide um, the x coordinates of each node within the layer. So you know the orders. After the step three, you know the orders of the nodes within the layer. And you want to decide, OK, exactly where they are on that layer, which is the x coordinates. And these, you start to consider those green ones, which we call the dummy nodes, is to, say, leave enough space and to allow you and um, draw an edge where there's past more than one layer. Okay, and um, so just to show you how complex how difficult this problem is, say and um, say in the step three you want to do crossing minimization. Basically you want to reorder the nodes and within a layer to reduce number of crossings. And even you fix the order of one layer and only change the order of the other layer. It's an NP hard problem. So basically, the number of times you have to try is exponential to the number of nodes. Basically, it means it's very difficult to find any optimal solutions in that case. And actually, I think um, um, most of the problems in each of the steps actually are NP complete or NP hard. And so overall, there's no one ever tries to do a big optimization problem consider all four steps at the same time rather than have to break it down, consider one step at a time. And I wouldn't really recommend you to try to implement your own one, unless you say you want to do a PhD in this. Um, okay, fairly quickly. And um, so then this study to evaluate how effective different layouts are. So in this study, it used three type of layout and say force directed, we have seen before. So if you, there's a method to start with, so there's FD. That's the, the first one, FDFR, is one of the first force directed layout methods. And this is another variation of the force directed. And this is the last one, another variation. <laughs> and they also tested the plan orthogonal grip join. And we haven't really covered these yet. So these are the ones with orthogonal edges, these, and finally the planar grid join, and where an old node has in, say integer coordinates. So the position of the nodes can only be 1, 2, it can't be 1.5, 2.3. <clears throat> so, but you can have edges which are not those, so I think these ones. For example, this one, all the nodes are on a grid position. Okay, and the result shows an SEIS performed significantly worse than the rest. So that's this one. For some reason, it performed worse than the rest. And all the others have similar performance. But basically, these ones, even they use quite different layout, there's not much difference in terms of the performance of people using them. And I couldn't quite understand why, but that's okay. Next study. Um, so there's more beyond um, the graph visualization we have so, seen so far. And many of them is based on so-called node link diagrams. So that's one way you represent <coughs> networks. You, as a node, 
has vertices in the graph and there's line segments as uh, edges connecting them. And so this usually is not very good when the graph is large or the edge, you got, oh, you've got lots of edges. So this is an example showing you've got lots of edges. It's actually very difficult to see the connections between the nodes. So this experiment or they're proposing doing a different way to represent this using a matrix. And so this is adjacency matrix. And if you're not familiar, and so each row, each row represents a node, and each column represents every node in the graph as well. And so if node A and node B connected, say for example, um, say let's say this is represents node A, this is node B, and if they connected, and this position here is kind of plotted to show these nodes connected together. So really, this is just a visual representation of the connectivity matrix of a graph. And the advantage is that it doesn't have any crossings. And the disadvantage is, is you can have large empty spaces. The graph doesn't have many edges. And the evaluation results show for <coughs> small graphs, and the no link diagrams is always better. And we will see very soon for anything bigger than 20 nodes, so anything less than 20 was what they meant by small graphs. So the matrix is actually better, except for, for the path finding tasks. So the path finding tasks is if you're given two nodes in the graph, you want to find the paths between the two, connected from the first node to the second node. And in that case, it doesn't really matter how the size is, and the node link is always better. OK, um, this is a more recent one about curved graph edges. And uh, anyone seen this one before? This is a visualization produced by the LinkedIn network. And particularly there, actually, it's my network. And on LinkedIn, I'm in the middle and connected to a group of people at various places. And so this is slightly different from previous ones because they're actually using curved edges to show, using curved edges to show the connections. And there's other techniques commonly called edge bundling or conflict join. And so again, these are two exact same networks. And so you put actually all the nodes on the circle on our side, and there's edges connecting them, kind of like circular layout. But you can actually bundle edges, as you see on the right, to better show kind of the structure of the network. Um, OK. And uh, so this, I did an evaluation on, say, curved edges. So we compared different types of curved edges. And it doesn't really show very well. But if you can see, these are some the same network, exactly the same node positions. The only difference is how the curved edges are used. <clears throat> so I don't really have time. But these are, the first one is called a long body layout. And the second one is just using Bayesian curves with less curvature, and then there's two control points. And the last one is, again, Bayesian curves, but using one control point, so you can see the edge is more curved. And these were compared with and the straight line version, so where exactly the same mode position, but it's straight line segment. And uh, all the people, I mean, the majority of people test actually prefer straight lines. And the performance-wise, and straight line is the best. And this one has performance close or almost the same as straight line. <clears throat> OK, and uh, this is the final part. So I'm going to show you some of the softwares you can use to visualize network. And because there's already lots of done, so you don't really have to program your own, which can be take lots of time and not, can be a bit tricky. And the first thing I want to mention is called, <coughs> sorry, bike graph editor. Anyone saw this one before? Okay, so that's a screenshot of the software. And it's a commercial product, but this, the editor itself is free. And it actually includes many layout and network algorithms 
So it includes all the examples we mentioned before, but didn't include different way of visual representing a graph, but different layout algorithms, and also got, uh, network layout, network algorithms. These are like completely different centrality as well. And it's quite mature. It's a commercial product. It's developed for a long time. Performance-wise, it's also good. And uh, Giphy, anyone seen this one before? Um, so it's kind of like a open source version of the Y Ed graph editor. It's open source, Java based, and its main focus is actually on social network analysis. So it's strong for this, and say um, to the implementation of different centrality measures, different network measures like clustering coefficients, things like that. And it's doing development. And 0 0.8.1 beta, that's the latest version when I checked. And actually, and this one got quite a bit of support from the LinkedIn network. So if you remember the curved edge ones, so the one on the top left is actually generated at the back end using Giphy. And so there's, okay, I want to few, mention a few more libraries. So these are the case when you want to write your own code, but just want to call, say, a function which give you a nice layout of a graph. So there's JGraph, and it's an open source commercial product. So it was not open source for a long time, it only become open source very recently, so you can get a copy. And it's probably the best free implementation of force directed methods, and so as the hierarchical one, so you can actually can guess the source code of implementation of different layout. And it has a Java and JavaScript version. So, so you can have the, uh, the, the same layout, both implemented in Java and in JavaScript. Very nice. Um, I think some people already mentioned the graph is. It has been along for, around for a long time, developed by the at and Research Lab. So it have a good collection of different layout algorithms, hierarchical, force directed radio, and circular. And it, I think the particularly strong point is the hierarchical and layout in this collection. Say the rest is included, but only implement the fairly basic version. But the hierarchical one is probably the best I've ever seen. And very fast, always use the latest, very, very complex algorithm there to make sure it's fast and accurate. And it can be used as a command line tool. So if you're familiar with command like a Unix, you can just use that pipeline. You can pass to it a text file, it generates a layout and give you. Or as a C library, you can get the code. And Yon, uh, or however I should pronounce it, is another Java library which you can use for visualizing net networks. And it is open source and it's focused on social network analysis, has some layout. And I think from the later version of those. And finally, and there's lots of information visualization libraries and in which the graph visualization is part of the library. Not necessarily the whole library is focused on visualization, but they do have some nonetheless. And first, a few JavaScript ones. D3, anyone using? Quite popular for anyone doing JavaScript visualization. And so similarly, uh, Protovid is kind of the version, a slightly different approach to D3, but developed by the same group person anyway. And there's InfoVis Toolkit, which is also a JavaScript library, and, but it's using the canvas instead of SVG as in D3. We Flare, which is Flash version, and Flash version, the InfoVis library, has and layout algorithms, Prefuse Java, and finally, a couple of domain-specific ones. The cytoscape, and designed specifically for biology. But it's actually, I'm quite impressed by the quality of the code there and the layout. And finally, PyArc is one of the many, and fairly, say, exclusively used in sociology, say, so, social network analysis, etc. Very fast, actually. And, okay a little bit over time. And so this is what we kind of touched on today. We talked about different visual representations of trees 
And we mentioned two types of layout algorithms for general graphs. And we talked about quite a few different evaluation, evaluate different methods, visualization methods, how effective they are, or how good they look. We mentioned a few softwares and libraries as well. I want to emphasize again, there's lots not quite covered. So what, if you want to find out a bit more, and this is a fairly recent survey of the latest work on the graph visualization. I leave the title there. I don't think it's in the slides, but uh, you will get, be able to get a copy of slide and this slide as well. So I'll give you lots more information about what's the latest development in the field. I think, yeah, that's all.